verse 17. Great Apostle Paul writes here in that 17th verse, For if by one man's offense, and that is uh, wrongdoing or transgression, by one man's wrongdoing, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. And who is that one? Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. By Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right. If you look back at verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I, I, I want to share with you today a message that I've titled. God's abounding grace. Would you say that with me? God's abounding grace. You may be seated. And remember, that word grace basically has to do with the kindness, the undeserved favor and kindness of God. And so today, we want to share with you about God's abounding grace. Yes, Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. The book of Romans is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. Rome was the capital and most important city in the Roman Empire. In Paul's day, the population of Rome was over one million people. And many of those people were slaves. It is believed that some of the people who were converted on the day of Pentecost most likely founded the church at Rome. Paul, with all of his missionary work, did not start this church at Rome, but was certainly influential as far as helping the church grow and have direction. And more than any other person, Paul was responsible for the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. And you know, it's amazing. We talk about amazing. It's amazing that God would use the same man to preach the same gospel that he once tried to destroy. That's just another testimony of God's abounding grace. Now, the 
theme, the theme of Romans is simply this. The righteousness that comes from God. That's really the theme of Romans. The righteousness that comes from God. The glorious truth that God justifies guilty, condemned sinners by faith alone, through grace alone, by Christ alone. God justifies guilty, condemned sinners by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone. And so, Paul writes here in verse 1 of, of chapter 5, if you have that handy there, Paul writes here saying, Therefore, being justified by faith, that word justified means to be made right with God. Somebody, I like the way somebody said justified is like saying just if I. Yeah, justified, just if I never done it. Justified, never done it. Justified, okay? And so, it says here, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, Jesus Christ. And then, you don't have to turn there, but it's in chapter 8. We find these words in verse 1 of chapter 8. He goes on to say, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we are Spirit-led, not flesh-led. And here's something else very important. We have to understand. We are all sinners by nature and by choice. That's who we are. We are sinners by nature and by choice. By nature, simply say, we were born sinners. We were born in sin. So, none of us had to teach our children to be good. That's right. Right? You didn't have to do that. You, 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 I'm sorry, you didn't have to teach them to be bad. Let me, let me back that up. You did have to teach them to be good. None of us had to teach our children to be bad, right? They just got it naturally, right? You know, snatching stuff, hitting other kids. You know, playing with them, they'll reach out, grab something, slap them in the head, you know. <laughs> they, you know, just by nature, we didn't have to teach our children to be bad. That's right. But we do have to teach them to be good. Amen. We don't have to teach our children to lie. <laughs> do we? Oh, no. But we do have to teach them to tell the truth. Yeah. I'm constantly telling my kids, tell the truth. They lie all the time. <laughs> now I know I probably shouldn't be up here telling you that, but that, that's just one thing that me and CJ are really going after. They lie. Oh, you mean them cute little preacher kids? Yep. That's our nature. We would much rather lie than tell the truth. So, one of them could do something wrong. The other four see them do the wrong. You ask the one that did the wrong, and they're going to say, no, I didn't. You got four witnesses who saw you did. But you still don't lie. That's our nature. We are sinners by nature. And by choice, and that probably thing, Dad should be able to talk about us lying. But y'all shouldn't be lying. No. <laughs> Amen? Amen? 
Can you tell me a kid that don't like I know some adults that like Amen. 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 Yeah. How about this adult life? Pastor, I'll be there Sunday. <laughs> no, you ain't coming. But they'll tell you one thing. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm really going to start giving to the Lord. I know I ain't been giving like I should, but I'm going to start giving to the Lord. <laughs> my, my, my. Uh -huh. I'll be lying, lying, lying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, we are sinners by nature and by choice. And so, when, when man sinned in the garden of Eden, his sin automatically condemned all of his descendants. Yes. All of his descendants were condemned because of his sin. Here's what I'm talking about. In chapter 5, look at verse 12. Go back to chapter 5 here. Look at verse 12. Romans 5, verse 12. Here's what the writer says. Paul says here, Wherefore? As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Well, why do we die? Sin. We die because of sin. Death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. Did you know that our sinful nature is present at the moment of conception? Right at the moment of conceptions. And, and the Bible tells us the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. Now, there are three things about death you really need to know. Three important aspects about death that I want to share with you here for just a moment. First of all, there's spiritual death. All right? Spiritual death basically talks about being separated from God. That's spiritual death. Being separated from God. The second thing is physical death. We all know about physical death. And then the last thing is <coughs> eternal death. Okay? So you have spiritual death, you have physical death, you have eternal death. Spiritual death simply meaning you're separated from God. You're spiritually dead. You're separated from God. Physical death that's self-explanatory. Eternal death is eternal separation from God and eternal torment where? In the lake of fire. Eternal separation from God. Eternal torment in the lake of fire. Now, it is that third death that you really want to avoid. Amen. There's not much you can do about the physical death. That's going to happen. One way or another, it's going to happen. The spiritual death, you already spiritually dead. One day you're going to be physically dead. Amen. But that third death, eternal separation from God, you can do something about that. There is something you can do about that, and, and we have to thank God's abounding grace that we have the opportunity to do something about that. Because the death of the body is not the same as the death of the soul. Eternal Separation from God. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Eternal separation from God is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Amen. It is. 
You might think, well, I lost my job. I lost my house. I lost my car. Now, those things are important. But they're not the worst thing Amen. that could ever happen to you because you can always get another house. Uh -huh. yes. Another car. You can get those things. You can get another job. It might not be the job that you want. But you can get another job. Uh -huh. You can get all those things. But when you die, and if you die without Jesus, you will be eternally separated from God. And that will be the worst thing that will have ever happened to you. Yes, Lord. Eternal separation from God. There are a lot of things in life that disturb us and that hurt us. But as I said before, those things that we go through in this life can in no way compare to what it's going to be like eternally separated from God. Last Wednesday, I did a funeral for a three and a half month old. This precious little baby was laid in a little tiny coffin. She looked like a little doll just laying there. Three and a half months old. As sad as that is, as tragic as that is, it looked like it was a crib death is what happened. There was no foul play. The baby just died. As tragic as that is, as sad as that is, let me tell you, that's not the worst thing that could happen to you. Now, and that's tough. I mean, it's, it's, it, it was horrible. But that's not the worst thing. That can happen to you. Uh -huh. If you leave this life without Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that is the worst thing yes, Lord. that can ever happen to you. Because the temporary pleasures of this life are not worth eternal separation from God. And that's why Jesus said, that's what he was talking about when he said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and then lose his soul? Now, I have to say this honestly. I don't envy rich people. I really don't. I don't envy rich people because the vast majority of rich people don't see a need for God. They don't. Amen. They think because they got stuff and because they got things, why do they need God? Because don't you need God for the things that they got? That's their warped kind of thinking. Now, I'm not saying all rich people are like that. No, they're not. There are some very godly, very dedicated, Jesus-loving rich people. I just ain't one of them. But there are some. And I thank God for those that are. I really do. Because what they do is they use their wealth for the glory of God. They don't just, you know, pour it out on themselves. They use it because they recognize it was God who allowed them to get it. And that's what Moses told the children of Israel. He said, now, when y'all get into this land that God has promised you, and you get all the benefits of the land, Moses said, you better remember who allowed you to get it. Amen. Don't think, Moses said, don't think you got it by yourself. He said, it's God who gives you the power 
to get well. Now, so, don't get me wrong. I ain't saying that I wouldn't like more than what I've got. I ain't saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, like the apostle says, the apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. Amen. And see, most wealthy people are not contented people. <coughs> because they spend most of their time getting more wealth. They don't have contentment. They don't have peace. They don't have hope. They don't have joy. They can buy a bed, $10,000, <coughs> but they can't buy rest. That's right. Amen. Right? Amen. They can spend millions of dollars on a house, but they can't buy a home. Amen. 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 See, a house is material. The home is the environment on the inside. Amen. And that's what makes it so special. There's a show that I watch from time to time called Behind Mansion Walls. It comes on a ID Discovery. If you some of y'all look at that channel, uh, it comes on that channel. Behind mansion walls. And, 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 and they do stories of wealthy, filthy rich people who commit hard crimes, <coughs> terrible crimes. And they show how on the outside they seem to be happy. They've got all the trappings of what the world says you should have so you can be happy. But Behind mansion walls, there's no contentment. There's no peace. There's no real happiness. But there's a whole lot of greed and mistrust. A whole lot of that goes on. So, we see here, according to Paul, even though... <coughs> Adam made a mess of things. God sent Jesus to straighten out the mess. Aren't you glad God did that? I'm so glad because of his abounding grace that he sent Jesus to straighten out the mess. Because you see, sin always has and always will make a mess of things. Adam was in a perfect environment. He himself was perfect. But when he sinned against God, everything changed. Sin always has and always will make a mess of things. Amen. You see, folks, temptation and temptations will knock at your door. That's right. Don't ask them to stay for dinner. <laughs> Amen. Amen. They're going to come. Nothing you can do about that. Amen. But there is something you can do about them staying. Yes, Lord. There is something you can do about that. And so, if you look at the world today and you see the war and the crime and the hatred, all of this stuff is a byproduct of sin. Uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanoes, all of this stuff is a part of a fallen Creation. So they, we, we use the term fallen man fell in the Garden of Eden into sin. 
Man fell into sin, and so because of sin, all of creation is now fallen. And we are a fallen creation in need of salvation. And God knew exactly what we needed. And he knew exactly what he was going to do. Because God never has to say, give me a minute. i got to figure this out. God never has to say that. Because he's already got to figure it out. Amen. Before he created man, he knew it would cost him dearly to redeem the man he would create. He knew that. But he did it anyway. Uh -huh. And I like what Paul says here. I like the way he puts it here. If you'll look again in this fifth chapter, the first part of the 19th verse. We read it a little while ago. Let's look at that verse again. 19a. Notice what he says here. For as by one man's disobedience Many were made sinners. Who was that one man? That's right. That one disobedient man. Because of that situation, because of him, many were made sinners. That's the bad news. But the good news is in that same verse. Look at the good news. The second part. So, by the obedience of one, shall many be made, what? Righteous. Who was that obedient one? Say it again. Now say it like you mean it. Between the shed and the wall. 
A little space there. That's where the man was living. And so I walked out there. I didn't get too close. <laughs> but I got close enough to see that he was breathing. And I said, well, Arnold, he, he, he looked like he breathing. <laughs> I said, but, you know, I, I don't know if he's running from the ball. And he just is exhausted and decided he gonna hide behind the shed. I doesn't know. I don't know if he's sick. And he just thought he would lay down and he just came with I don't know. So I thought for a minute, should I no, I shouldn't. No, I'm not. I said, where my phone? I put in the number of 911. That's what I did. I said, this, I don't think this is an emergency. I said, but this man laying on our church property, right next to the wall of the church. And so, I mean, in a matter of minutes, they were here. They were here. And so they parked in that back parking lot back there, two officers, and they came to the man who was laying there. And I happened to walk back outside as I saw them approach the man. I walked by, I walked, I walked back outside, and one of the officers said, Chris, wow. get up, man. How <laughs> did we know him? <laughs> and so the guy started moving a little bit. Sitting up as best he could, Chris was tore up. <laughs> Chris was tore up. And they knew Chris. I said, this is like Andy, but how did you, you remember Otis? How did you remember Otis? <laughs> you know, I, I thought Chris was going to walk down the fellowship hall, open the door, and just come yeah. on in, you know? And just, So they said, Chris, get up, get up, Chris. And so he got up, he got up, and um, they said, well, Chris, you, 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 you can't stay here. And I said, officer, I, 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 they said, we're not going to arrest him. I said, okay, all right, good, because he, he ain't done nothing. He said, but he, he's homeless, and he's an alcoholic. Sin continues to ruin lives today. That's what sin does. Yes, it does. My heart really did go out to that guy. And the officer said, well, you know, there's really not a lot you can do. And I know what he meant, and he's right to some degree. But if somehow, if Chris can know Jesus, Amen. That changes everything. Amen. And I don't know, maybe, just maybe, he'll come back again. And now that I recognize him. <laughs> Chris! <laughs> you back again? <laughs> come on in, I'll give you a Pepsi, man. You know, I'll, I'll give you a Pepsi or something. And uh, I'll probably talk to him next time. <laughs> But that, that's what sin does. Sin destroys. Amen. Sin, sin wastes. What a waste. But that's what sin does. And, and, and guess what? There are, there are characters in the Bible whose lives were wasted because of sin. I think of a man named Samson. Wasted. Messed up man. Ruined by sin. Yeah, did God use him? Sure did. God did use him. But 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 I believe God wanted to use Samson a whole lot more than what he did use him. But because Samson, Samson played games with his relationship with God. He did, he played games. He thought because he was so strong 
Nobody can stop him. He kept playing with sin. He got stopped. And they gouged his eyes out. And he ended up dying with his enemies. Sin will do you in. Will it? It will do you in. Jesus is ready, willing, and able to come to your rescue. Through Adam, all of humanity inherited his fallenness and his depravity. But through Christ, humanity can be set free from the bondage of that fallenness. And so the songwriter said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fellow I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so, because of God's abounding grace, we are able to experience that abundant life that only He can give. Let's thank God today for His abounding yes, Lord. grace. Let's pray together as we thank God for His abounding yes, Lord. grace. Now, our Father, how can we say thanks for all that you've done for us? You paid a debt you didn't owe. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. We needed someone to wash our sins away. You sent Jesus all the way from glory to live, to die, and to rise again from the dead so that we can have victory over death hell and the grave. We thank you, Lord, for that. And let's remember that we are more than average. We have worth and our lives are important to God. Let's thank him and bless him Jesus' name.